Okay, so it's been on my mind that the first assignment, we only did 10 of the 20 questions. We did the ones that were for ratios. And it's been on my mind that those other 10 questions are to do with mergers. Now, normally, according to my lecture schedule, I would only get to mergers in lecture 6. So we're going to have to do mergers or a piece of mergers, at least, early to get that assignment done. So I thought we would just get it done today. And then it's done, and then I can focus on WAC, because WAC will take a couple of lectures, perhaps, to do. Okay. So today we are going to start, and you'll see that what I've given you is the first handout on mergers, but we're just going to talk about the theory and the principles, because all of those multiple choice questions are theory-ish. Okay, so the first <coughs> thing about mergers is that companies need to grow to live, yeah, to survive. All companies need growth to survive. A company that doesn't grow, that is stagnant, is a company that will eventually close down and die. Company growth initially starts off as, they call it intrinsic growth, it's internal growth. And companies usually try to grow, especially initially, mostly internally. And how do we grow internally? We grow internally by introducing new products. And I'm not saying that companies don't keep trying to introduce new products even later, but initially especially introduce new products, uh, identify new markets for their existing products, uh, go to new locations, uh, maybe set up web sites so that they can trade internationally, globally, isn't it? So companies will initially try to, uh, or even um, increase market share, increase their market share, steal market share from competitors, create new markets, create new products, go into new locations where they previously weren't, and they will try to expand their business that way. But this intrinsic or internal growth is limited, and the bigger that you get, the more difficult it is to find new products or to go to places where nobody's been, isn't it? And so that's when we then start to look at mergers and acquisitions. And the main reason for a merger is for growth, is for a company to grow. Yeah. When we look at mergers and acquisitions, there are... Let me... I think, yeah, add a page. When we look at mergers and acquisitions, we're really looking at three possible types of mergers or acquisitions. The first of those is horizontal. And if I say to you, here's a company, who do you think they should buy? You're probably going to say to me, the competitor, isn't it? And that's a horizontal acquisition. It's when we buy a competitor. And it's interesting because the definition of competitor is not always as straight line as we see it. Yeah? I remember once um, sitting in a planning meeting at Coke, and it was when the lotto first came out. Do you remember when the lotto, do you remember that? No, too long ago for you. Okay, so there was a time we didn't have lotto. You couldn't buy lottery tickets. There were no casinos in South Africa. If you wanted to go to a casino, you had to go outside of our borders and into the neighboring countries like Sun City, which was in the old Bopututswana, right? And the, in, this, in South Africa's borders, there were no casinos. There was no gambling. We were all very straight-laced, you know, religious country. But um, then there was this time when the lottery came out. And I remember Coke saying that they had done some research into the impact that lottery tickets were going to have on the sale of Coke, especially the sale of Coke products like Coke cans in a shell garage, for example, because they said people would have limited buying power or limited spending money, and what they would do when they go to a shell garage is they would look at the Cokes in the cooler and they would look at the lotter machine and then they'd have to decide one or the other. Yeah? So it's quite interesting sometimes what is a competitor, and it's not always 
somebody that sells the same product as you, but it's somebody that is targeting the same consumer spend that you are targeting. Do you understand? So it could be bigger. So, but a horizontal acquisition is when you acquire a competitor that is selling goods to the same people you would be selling goods to, and presumably, if it's a straight competitor, it would be the same kind of goods, isn't it? It would be beverages, or it would be uh, cell phones, it would be in the same industry. Yeah? Do you find that it did affect uh, um, It did affect that particular uh, type of sale. The, they call it the immediate consumption product, which is where you go to a cell garage, there's, you're, you're thirsty, there's the Coke, and you buy it and you drink it. It didn't affect um, like the stuff that gets sold in restaurants, the stuff that gets sold in supermarkets, not really that sort of product, but yes, the other one it did. Okay. Um, so that's a horizontal acquisition. We acquire a competitor. The second type of acquisition is called a vertical acquisition. Vertical acquisitions are sometimes also called backward integrations. Backward integrations. But they could work backward or forward. And when we look, look at a vertical acquisition, it looks like this. Where at the very top I have my raw material. And at the very bottom I have my consumer. And this thing is called a value chain. A value chain. And along this value chain are many companies. There's the company that mines the iron ore. And then there's the company that takes that and melts it down and makes it into steel. And then there's the company that takes that and makes that steel into a product. And then there's a company that makes the cars. And then there's the company that sells the cars. And then there's the person who buys the car. Do you agree? So. Along this value chain are many companies, some of them producers of raw materials, some of them producers of sort of interim products, producers of the final product, then people that don't produce, they just distribute, have warehouses, do distribution, eventually to a retailer who then sells it to a customer. Isn't it? Oh, the guys in the middle, the wholesalers, isn't it? So sometimes to the wholesaler first, so if you think like uh, guys that own small um, like spaza shops or whatever, they will buy from macro, so the product goes from Coke to macro, from macro to the guy who owns the spaza shop, from him to you. Yeah, lots of people along that value chain. So what a vertical acquisition says is it says, let's buy, if we are the manufacturer somewhere in the middle here, let's buy the company that makes our raw materials because then we can reduce costs, isn't it? Or you might even be working downwards. And if you think of a company like Macro, I don't know if, I mean, I'm old eh, compared to the rest of you. There was a time that not anybody could buy at Macro. The Macro cards were only for people that could prove that they had businesses. Because the way it worked with, at Macro is that you didn't pay VAT. But in that time, time, it was called GST, general sales tax. And the way it worked is if you could prove you were a business, you didn't pay that GS, GST. General sales tax. Sounding strange on my tongue, but that's what it was. Because you know how VAT works. VAT works is you buy something from macro, you pay the VAT. But then when you sell it to somebody else, you claim that VAT and you claim it back, isn't it? So VAT is something that flows like down the chain. The way that general sales tax worked is if you could prove you were a company and you were going to on sell it to a person, you didn't have to pay the VAT. So there was a time when you, nobody could shop at Macro unless they could prove that they had a company or had a business, and then they could get a card. But now anybody can shop at Macro, isn't it? There was also a time, for example, that, um, yeah, I don't know. So I'm just looking, coming down the value chain from wholesaler to retailer. Um, these uh, spe speciality shops that you see popping up, that have been popping up for a while now, you can go and buy Nike stuff at the Nike shop. Adidas stuff at the Adidas shop, isn't it? There was a time when those shops didn't exist, so Nike and Adidas were not at the bottom of the value chain. They were somewhere in the middle, and they relied on the Edgars and the Statterfords to sell their stuff, isn't it? And then they decided, no, why don't we have our own stores, our own shops, and sell our own stuff? Then they were suddenly down here. Yeah? So that's a vertical acquisition. When we look at these two, do you agree with me that this one is going to make sales bigger. I've taken on a competitor. All his customers, all his markets, all his products now are mine. It makes the sales bigger. 
If I look at this one, a vertical, what this one does is it makes the costs smaller. Because instead of that raw material guy making money when he sells me his material, I'm making it myself, isn't it? So their material costs less for me. Makes my costs smaller. Both of those things make profit bigger, isn't it? And that's one of the key things when we have a merger and acquisition, is that we need to have what we call synergies. We need to look for synergies. We need to look for reasons economic, what is it called in your thing, economic benefits. We need to look for economic benefits, reasons why it makes sense to buy a specific company. So if we look at the economic benefits that are listed there in your handout, and I'm going to talk about the third type of merger now. We talk about economies of scale, cost savings. You know that if you look at the macro group, macro, Dion's, game, they're all part of the same group. They have one accounting system, one uh, accounting department that is shared among all of them. One buyer that buys in for all of them. Yeah? So cost savings, because instead of having three departments, you now have one. One accounting system. They use the same accounting system, the same point of sale system, the same inventory control system. One, cost benefits. Synergy, revenue growth. I use the example, I, I was once involved in the acquisition of Oros. Coke wanted to buy Oros. So we were, they were talking, there were initial talks, we were doing initial valuations, and um, we were looking at the possibility that if we could put Oros on every Coke truck, what that could mean to Oros. It would just go poof. Do you agree? So synergies is where, or, um, where if you take one plus one, so we take Coke and we take Oros, but if we put them together, it doesn't give you two. It gives you like five. So they say synergies is one plus one is three. When you put two things together, the fact that they're working together makes both of them better. Um, marketing gains, stronger distribution networks. That's this Coke distribution network, isn't it? People often think that Coke's strength is their products, but it isn't at all. It's their distribution network. They can get a Coke can into the deepest, darkest place you go, and you'll see a little cooler selling Coke, isn't it? Uh, and it's their marketing. When you see that red and white, it makes you think, oh, there's something refreshing or cool or nice, isn't it? So marketing gains, strong distribution networks, management. You might decide to buy a company purely for its management. Somebody that's entrepreneurial, that's done really well, and you want him to come into your business and do great things, isn't it? Uh, to enter new markets, it's much quicker to enter new markets if you buy someone already there. I used to do the audit of EMI Music. EMI Music used to sell their music in all the traditional places, right? Into the shopping malls, the musicers, the hyperamas, the games, the Dion's, that kind of stuff. But there was a big market that they were missing, which was the informal sector. You know, the spas, the shops, and the, in the townships and all that. And then at one point, they decided rather than trying to go that way themselves, they just entered into a deal with a guy that did that, that sold there. Yeah? So sometimes it's quicker to buy somebody who's already got something. Uh, financial reasons, liquidity. A company that is cash flush, that has lots of cash, is a prime takeover target, isn't it? You buy them, you get all their cash. You can spend it. Yeah? That's like why, why people marry rich husbands. Yeah? Prime takeover targets, rich husbands. Take all their cash. Yeah, that too. That too. But men don't really, I don't know, some men are a bit funny about the rich wives, isn't it? It's, it's a bit emasculating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You see. That's it. It's emasculating, right? Take some, yeah, no. Mm -mm. Then we have strategic benefits, the backward integration, which we've talked about, and the reducing of competition. This yeah increases your sales, but it also gets rid of somebody that could maybe hurt you, isn't it? So it's a double gain. And then we have our investment opportunities. So sometimes companies get bought because somebody just wants to strip their assets. Like, um, I, I always use the examples of what I know. At Coke, the one time, they had a problem with capacity. 
They just couldn't produce enough. There just wasn't enough machinery. When they investigated what it was going to cost to get a new piece of plant in, it was going to take 18 months to get it installed and ready. What is the word? There's a word they use. It keeps my mind now. And so 18 months, you know, you have to order it. They have to manufacture it for you. It has to be shipped because it's big ass stuff. Then once it's here, you have to build it. You uh, build the housing for it and you have to get an engineer to put it in, test it. And before it's actually working for you, 18 months is what they said. So what they did is they started to look around. You know when you go into, especially like the macros and that, you see lots of like no-name brand drinks, isn't it? And they found this guy that had plant. And he had some beverage that he was canning, which like nobody, like the other day you were drinking a beverage that I didn't recognize, yeah? Some iced tea, or I don't know what it was. So they wanted to buy him. They started talks to buy him. But they were going to kill his product. They weren't interested in anything except that machine. Yeah? So that's like asset stripping, isn't it? You go in, you don't want the guy's product. You're not interested in the markets he sells in. You don't want his product. You don't want anything. You just want that machine. But to buy it, you have to buy him out. Because if you buy that machine from him, he's got nothing left anyway, isn't it? So asset stripping is another reason why people sometimes do mergers. They might do mergers because the share price is low and it's a good buy. Yeah, so actually it doesn't add anything great to your business, but it's a good buy. It's cheap. Or you might um, do it for technology. Technology is such, such a big part of business today, especially some businesses, isn't it? My husband is uh, at Standard Bank. He's busy working on a new banking online system. And it's costing hundreds of millions of rands, this new system, to put in. And... Um, if you think about if you can buy a company that's already done all that work and that has a system that works, isn't it? Then you would buy it just for that so that you could get that technology so that you can also use it. You're in technology, so you know how important it is. All right, so that's reasons why we would do mergers and acquisitions. And you can see that verticals and horizontals make sense in terms of all these reasons, isn't it? There's a third type of uh, merger and acquisition which is called a conglomerate. A conglomerate. Conglomerates, the, the best example that I have is Virgin. If you think of Virgin Group. Virgin Group does everything and more. They have an airline. They have a music shop. If you've ever been to London, you know they have a huge music shop. They have a credit card, a banking. They have a cell phone operator. They make cola. They make virgin color. They have a gym. Yeah, we've, I'm really right here by the gym. They do a million different things, isn't it, this virgin group. When you look at what's in that group, it's different industries. It is different, um, completely different risk profiles, different profitability, different systems or technology that would get used in those industries. And you could even argue that it would need different management to really efficiently run a business like that. Because if you currently own a gym and you decide you're going to buy an airline, do you think that the management that's running the gym so well would necessarily run the airline well? No, isn't it? However, we sometimes do see these, and we've got a brilliant example in our own country of this. Can anybody think of what it is? It's a guy called Brian Joffe who owns a company called Bidvest. And if you look at Bidvest, they also are in everything. They're in insurance. They sell flour and baking goods. They're in retail. They just bought an airline. He just bought that airline that was going bust, isn't it? He's now, recently last year, was wanting to buy a pharmaceutical company. He just buys whatever and anything that he can. Okay, when we look at these conglomerates, um, in principle, in theory, they're wrong because there's no synergies, isn't it, in a conglomerate. So there are no synergies in a conglomerate. The other reason they're wrong is that the only benefit of a conglomerate is risk diversification. A conglomerate diversifies risk. 
You must agree with that, isn't it? So if I have a company and they have a cola, they have music, they have an airline, they have a gym, yeah, the risk is pretty diversified. Eh? Chances are when one business is doing bad, the other one's doing good, and things balance each other out. But there's an argument in finance that says risk diversification should be left up to oh, should be left up to the shareholder or the investor. Let me say investor. Investor is a better word. It should be up to the investor to decide how he wants to set up his portfolio. Do you agree? You as an investor should be able to decide if you want to invest in an airline and then if you want to invest some more of your money in a credit card bank or in an insurance company or in a gym. It should be up to you. It shouldn't be up to whoever you've bought shares in and have given money to. Do you agree? So the only thing that we really see here is we see somebody else diversifying risk for you. And we, what we often see here is we see very strong individuals. So here there's a guy called Brian Joffe. One of my students one year said to me that he knew somebody that worked for Brian. And Brian got a bee in his bonnet one Sunday and said, board meeting, everybody at the office. And this guy was at a family affair, function, funeral, I don't know what. He didn't make it. Monday morning, he got fired. Your priorities are not right. <laughs> Work is not that important. We are, you know, but the company is not that important to you. We think that we, you would be better off somewhere else. Goodbye. He got fired. Okay, so there we have Brian Joffe. Over here we have Sir Richard Branson. Yeah. And that's who you have. And if you think there's also that guy that's running for president, what? Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> eh? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is a little bit different because Warren Buffett doesn't actually, his businesses don't do anything. He invests. He's an investor. Yeah. But he invests in a whole bunch of companies. And he invests in a whole bunch of companies. So if you wanted, if you trusted him, you give him his money and he chooses where to invest it. So it's more like that. Whereas these conglomerates, they're actually running these businesses, isn't it? So Brian is running that airline. He's running that pharmaceutical business. He's running the insurance company. He's actually running them you know, as companies. And the, the sales, there's sales and there's cost of sales if you look at those group financials. If you look at uh, uh, Warren Buffett's, his financials is investments and all he's got is profit or, sale on, on, profit or loss on sale of those and dividend income. Yeah? But he's very interesting. He, he is the biggest, biggest individual shareholder of Coca-Cola is Warren Buffett. He actually, the one year, went to a shareholder meeting and got the president fired. He wasn't happy with the work he was doing and got a whole lot of investors together. And investors are strong eh, if, if, in that kind of scenario. I'm someone who is like this. I don't know who's going to go to the gym. He owns like two shop garages, two sets of garages. He owns a steel company. He owns a car 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 But it's his own money. Yeah. That's the difference with Bidvest and Virgin is that that's not his money. That's shareholder money. Okay, some of it might be his. We don't know. I don't know how much is his. Brian as well. Some of Bidvest is his. I don't know how much. But they listed companies. So these companies, they, it's somebody else's money. It's not their money. Do you know what I mean? But Donald Trump uh, isn't listed. No, he's not. He uses, no. Uh, I just mentioned him because he's like a megalomaniac. <laughs> so it's like, it's just personality, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah. Shareholders can only make money through dividends or capital growth. That's all. So if you own shares, you hope that that share price keeps growing so that one day when you sell them, you make money. That's how you make money. When you sell them, you make money. Capital gain, exactly. Capital growth. Or dividends. Although young shareholders like you, you're not looking for companies with big dividends because then that just means money that you have to find to invest again, isn't it? Or find somewhere to invest again. So you're looking more for more big capital growth, lower dividends perhaps. When you, get, when you get to retirement, you're looking for the opposite. Now you want the companies that give dividends because that's what you're living on. And you're not really interested in capital growth because you're going to be dead. <laughs> Unless you want to leave a legacy. You started investing. You're going to retire at 40. <laughs> well, you can retire now like him. 
Retire and fish. All right. Yeah, there we go. All right, so if you look at your handout, that's basically the principles of, uh, behind mergers and acquisitions, why they happen, what we're looking for. The textbook then goes into a little bit of discussion of why they fail. Most of the time, the reasons mergers and acquisitions fail is people. Yeah? You can imagine that in a merger scenario, there's always going to be people that are upset, isn't it? Management that now are going to be taken over. Because you can bet when Brian buys a business, he, those managers in that business, they are going to be um, replaced with his own guys, isn't it? And it makes sense. He's there. Why? He's trying to get this uh, airline turned around and profitable, and he's having to fight the guys that were there before that don't want to change, that don't want to do the things that he wants to do, isn't it? Why would he want to do that? Rather shift them out, move new people in. Um, so people, usually. But if we look, it says lack of managerial fit, lack of commercial fit. It might be that the product doesn't fit your range. That's when we're looking at um, one of these. Oh. You know that um, Coke, for example, has done quite a lot of acquisitions. Some of them here, and you know, a couple there, but mostly here. So they, for example, sell coffee. You know, the, the, or the drinks that are sold at McDonald's are all Coke drinks. So the juice, the Minute Maid juice, the Powerade, the coffee is a Coke drink. But sometimes you have a, f a fit problem, isn't it? So the product fit or the product range doesn't really go together. There's a lack of congruence. Sometimes you pay too much money. If you pay too much money because you think things are going to be fantastic and they don't work out that way, then that's a fail. Um, sometimes it costs too much to fix. So Brian maybe was looking for the, the, to pay a cheap amount of money for that airline, but maybe it's too expensive to fix it. You know, you think you can fix it, but you can't. Uh, failure to integrate. So you thought you could run one system. You thought you could have one accounting department, but then it turns out that that's not so easy to do in practice. And then inability to manage change. That's people. In South Africa, we have a number of legal implications. We have this competition commission. The competition commission is looking to protect against monopolies. So, in fact, when I was talking to you earlier and I said to you there was a, a, a deal on the table with Oros. Oros was eventually sold to, um, to the Avenge Group, Angloval, to the Angloval Group, to Angloval Industries, AVI. And the reason that it was that the, the deal with Coke fell off the table is because once they had got the lawyers involved and all of that, they felt that it was very unlikely that the Competition Commission would approve the deal. And it's because there's this huge beverage industry which already owns, has such a big hold on the market. And now they want to buy another company that has a strong hold on the, on the squashes, you know, the Oros. And then they just felt that that was never going to go through. So in the end, Oros were, was sold to AVI, Angloval Industries. They own um, Simba, Bakers, some of those companies. Um, <clears throat> so that's one of the, that, that's the Competition Commission. They're looking to protect minorities. We also have the Companies Act. No, no, the, the Competition Commission is looking to prevent monopolies. Okay. We also have the Companies Act. The Companies Act seeks to protect minorities. So what the Companies Act says is, if you're here and you want to buy that company, that competitor, the Companies Act is protecting the minorities and it forces you to make the same offer that you're making to the guys who own the majority share to everybody. So let's assume this competitor, there's a guy who owns 60% and then there's small shareholders who own the other 40. If you're going to buy that 60, you have to make the same offer to all the other guys who own the 40. Yeah, because they wanted to be shareholders of that company. They don't necessarily now want to be shareholders of your company, isn't it? So they should also have the choice to sell if they want to. All right, so that's the Companies Act. We also have the JSC. Where's my thing? We have the Takeover Regulation Panel. Uh, and the uh, uh, I think it's one of the JSC-linked panels that just looks after the acquisitions and takeovers of public companies, and that's the JSC-listed companies, isn't it? The JSC has their own rules, especially around trading. Like when there's a merger or there's a transaction happening, sometimes they suspend trading on those, trans on those shares, isn't it? Just to stop people that have some inside information making money off somebody else that doesn't know. 
Yeah. So sometimes trading of shares is suspended in certain times, especially in times of mergers and acquisitions. There's also the Security Services Act that looks at insider trading and market manipulation. And there's the exchange control. If they are last year, we had that big acquisition by Walmart. Yeah, they bought MassMart, they bought the macro group, and that there were huge reserve bank implications with that transaction, of course. Right, so that's the theory behind M&As. We're going to, let me just quickly show you the, the process of what happens in an M&A so that then you can see where we are in context. If there's a merger, the first step of the merger is why and then who. Yeah. So why do we want to, to merge? What are, what are the synergies that I'm looking for? Am I looking for a competitor? Am I looking for a... To, to, to do a backward integration and buy a, a raw material provider? Am I buying a company because I think that it's cheap, it's doing badly, it's got losses, and if I buy it, I can turn it around and do better, right? Why? So this one is the, that horizontal, vertical conglomerate story. Then I move on to the who, and the who is identifying the targets. So once I've decided, no, I need to broaden, so like if I look at that Oros one, it was, I need to broaden my product range out of, because there was a time Coke only did carbonated soft drinks. Then they decided they better broaden their product range. So squashes is something they weren't into, right? So then you identify the targets. Which companies are there yeah, that have this, that are potential targets? Once you've identified the targets, the next step is something we did last week, which is, financial analysis because remember at this stage you haven't approached anybody it's like behind closed doors isn't it so you get whatever information you have publicly available financial statements and you do a financial analysis yeah once you've done a financial analysis now you then can select your target who it is that you want to acquire then once you've done that we then do evaluation and we agree a price that's what we do during that valuation although there might be a gap sometimes between valuation and price that's the goodwill yeah we do evaluation we agree a price and then I'm just going to move it down this way we need to look for financing so now I've, I've decided that I want to buy somebody. I found somebody to buy. I'm discussing with them um, what their company is worth. I do evaluation. The valuation, by the way, we're going to look at specifically, but these valuations take into account these synergies, isn't it? The value of Oros to Coke is bigger than the value of Oros to Oros. Yeah? Um, so we then do evaluation, which takes into account the synergies, which might be revenue up, cost down, whatever they are. I agree a price, and then I need to finance it. So financing is then going to be long-term financing. Do you agree? Big long-term assets, that's going to be there forever. A company is there forever. So financing needs to be big, needs to be there forever. So it's going to be uh, equity or debt, but long, long-term debt, isn't it? So maybe even things that are not redeemable or that are redeemable in 20 years, something like that. Financing. We might even do a share swap. Yeah. Uh, and then somewhere along the line here, there's a due diligence. So before we sign on the dotted line, we do a due diligence. And due diligence is something that you talk about in auditing. I don't know if you've talked about it yet. But due diligence is really just your final audit. So we do one final audit on the company before we sign on the dotted line. And that final audit is just to check. And th this due diligence is financial, it's legal, it's environmental, it's technical. Uh, I once was sent on a due diligence up in Zimbabwe, and I had a tour of the plant. And I remember taking pictures because they had such old machines that when they filled the bottles at the end, there was a guy with a jug. And either the bottles would have overfilled or underfilled, and he would be pouring from the bottle into the jug if it was too full, because now it had spilt all over the bottle. Or if it had underfilled, he was filling it up, topping it up, before the lids got put on, which also happened manually then, obviously. 
But you know, a modern machinery, it all in goes the empty bottle, zoop, out comes the full bottle with the lid on, isn't it? And already sort of ready to be put into like a case of six or a case of 12 or whatever it is. But anyway, so due diligence, many types of due diligence, legal tax due diligence even, isn't it? The worst thing is you buy a company and you find they have huge tax liabilities. It's your company now, sorry for you, isn't it? If you didn't know about it and didn't build it into the agreement, tough. So um, that's the process. So today we've talked about one and two. We did this one, the first lecture, isn't it? We're going to come back to mergers when I said to you we're going to do it in lecture six and we're going to come back to that one and this one. How do we do merger valuations? How do we do financing of mergers? What kind of things do we consider? Due diligence, we don't talk about in this module really. When you get to honours, they sometimes ask due diligence in the MAC questions. But it is something that's more discussed in the auditing questions. Other services that auditors provide, one of them is a due diligence. Okay. So, in your assignment questions. Um, it's 11 to 20, it's mergers, it's a merger. We're going to discuss as we go, and in some cases they've referred to you to certain sites online, which I was on this morning and I've taken copies. So it says, we have a South African gold producer, Mac Reef. They said on Monday that they'd been approached by Mineco looking to acquire Mac Reef. The company's share price was up over 5% on the announcement. The main asset is the Tau Lakoa gold mine, which produced 110,000 ounces of gold in the last year. So there's a mine company called Mac Reef. It looks like they're a gold mining company. Their main asset is this gold mine. And they produced some gold last year. And they were approached by a company called Mineco to buy them out. Mineco is the acquirer. Mac Reef is the target, the selling company. So let's look at the things they say and let's see if we can answer them. The first one says, suppose that the market price of Mineco is 45 rand a share and that of Mac Reef is 30 rand a share. If Mineco offers three-fourths of, of a share of the ordinary shares for each share in Mac Reef, the ratio of exchange in market prices would be what? So <clears throat> I'm going to do a big M and a small m. Big m's share price, 45 rand. Small m's share price, 30 rand. They're going to offer three quarters of a share for one share. They want to know what is the exchange in value terms. Forty-five, three quarters is thirty-three point seven five to thirty. So if I then divide both sides by thirty, I get one point one two five to one. Agreed. So that share exchange, if we're looking at value, so what they've said, you all agree that, that I've interpreted it correctly? What they've said is that they will give three quarters of a share for every share that a Mac guy owns. So he has the small Mac guy. He's a shareholder. So I'm going to say M and Mac. This small Mac guy is a shareholder. And mine co is saying to, Mac, to that Mac guy, for every share you own, I'll give you three quarters of one of my shares. Three quarters of one of his shares is worth 33 rand 75. He's getting 33 rand 75 of value for 30 rand, which is what he currently has. So he's getting 1.125 for 30. So that's that one. I think we agree, yeah? Okay. It says, in the long run, a successful acquisition is one that enables Mineco to make an all-equity pur purchase, thereby, thereby avoiding additional leverage. Do you think that a successful acquisition really is dependent only on how we pay for it? No, isn't it? I mean, we can 
do it just by equity and it can still be a bad acquisition, isn't it? So I would say that one is not true. How can, and I always say to students, what we pay or how we pay for an asset does not affect the value of that asset. And I've said this to you before, isn't it? Whether I buy my car cash and you buy yours through debt, the cars are the same, they're worth the same, they have the same value, isn't it? It's just that one of us owns their car, the other one, the bank owns the car. Okay. Enables MineCo to diversify its asset base. I suppose diversifying an asset base could be seen to be successful, but we're looking in the long run, and in the long run, it's only what we can do with that asset base, isn't it? That could be good. So that one, I'm going to put a question mark. Increases the market price of Mineco's share capital over what it would have been without the acquisition. Who likes that one? That one, isn't it? Look, what we're saying is in the long run, <laughs> in the long run, the market price of Mineco will be bigger than what it would have been if I hadn't done the acquisition. So that's really the aim, isn't it, of any company, is growth, is to make their market price bigger. As a, as a, a company, that's your objective, is to increase shareholder wealth, isn't it? That's your long-term objective. So that one, I think, is that one. Increases financial leverage. Do you know what leverage is? It's debt, isn't it? If you remember from second year, we talked about leverage and obtaining leverage. Leverage is debt. So financial leverage especially is debt. So how can a successful acquisition be one where your debt goes up? How can that be good? I don't know. So that one I would say no. That one there I thought could be an answer, maybe the asset-based one, but it's not the perfect answer. Which of the following typically is the most important economy or synergy which is sought for, from MNAs? Economies of scope from applying existing resources to new uses at additional, little additional cost. Revenue and marketing synergies from new, enhanced, or more efficient distribution. Economies of scale effects from organizational learning. Oh, okay, there's a very um, academic one. We, we're going to be better off afterwards, isn't it? Even if it's a total disaster, we will have learned from our mistakes. Economies of scale from doing away with duplication of function between the two firms. Okay, so what do you think? Do you think it's one? Who thinks it's one? No. Okay, do you think it could be two? Maybe two. Okay, yeah. Do you think it's three? Yeah. Yeah, I would say, mm, not really. Do you think it could be four? It could be. Yeah. So look at what they do. This one here makes sales bigger. This one here makes costs smaller. And the question asks you, which is the most important economy or synergy that sort? Now you have to decide which one you think is most important. But I'll tell you that I think that the most important is sales bigger. Because you can only make costs smaller to a limit, isn't it? There's only a limit to which you can really reduce costs. When you're looking to increase profitability, reducing costs is a very short-term strategy that has a ceiling. I mean, you can't fire everybody. Whereas increasing revenue or having growth doesn't have a ceiling, isn't it? And that can grow exponentially then. So for me, I do think it's a two, but I will leave it up to you both. But two, three, and four were all synergies, I thought, isn't it? Um, not one. Maybe even one a little bit, but I don't know. I think it's two, but I'll leave it up to you to, to decide. The most Im I hate these when they say the most important because it means they're all more or less true. And then, okay, 14. Which of the following would not be acquired from MacReef in the event of a takeover? Working capital. Do you know what working capital is? Inventories, receivables, payables. Assets, machinery. I don't know, what assets does a mine have? Mine shafts, liabilities debt that they owe, a bond, uh, 
or share premium share premium isn't it yeah so if we take over the company we want its assets we want inventory we don't really want liabilities but they come with assets isn't it nobody's going to give you an asset and then they still owe the bank the money and then they'll say to you no it's okay the bank won't allow it in fact if you still owe for that thing so i think that one is four Mineco wants to acquire MacGreef through a leveraged buyout transaction. What did we say leverage was? Debt. Okay. What is an LBO? A type of joint venture. It's an acquisition in which a large acquirer has leveraged through bargaining power over a small target. It's an acquisition which is funded from a relatively large amount of debt. It's an acquisition which is funded from a relatively low amount of debt. Even if you knew, knew, knew nothing, just this, these two are kind of saying to you, well, it's probably one of those, isn't it? And it is. Okay. A leveraged buyout is one where you don't have money. You don't ha you're going to borrow it. You're going to get it from somebody else, isn't it, to invest. Okay. Which of the following is the correct formula for the additional cash flows so that we're going a little bit into valuation but we did talk about synergies so i think you'll be able to do it is the correct formula for the, for the additional cash flows from an acquisition a is the pre-tax profits of the company so this we're looking at mac okay mac we're going to buy mac mac's going to make my cash flows in my business go bigger by what amount the pre-tax profits of MAC, the annual depreciation, the additions to profits from synergies, and the tax of profits. So A, plus or minus B, plus or minus C, plus or minus D. Which one? Number three. Okay, you all say three. A, top profit, minus depreciation. Is depreciation cash flow? So is depreciation in the profit? It's made the profit smaller. And if I want to take it out, I must make it? <laughs> okay, but you are sort of on the right track. It's just you hadn't thought it through. We're going to ignore depreciation. Correct. But how do we ignore depreciation? We add it back. Yeah? We add it back. We add back depreciation. We're looking for cash. So if you think about uh, if I see 2601 cash flows what did we do with depreciation we add it back isn't it or even when we do when we did Mac 2601 and we did those investment things and there was depreciation we in the profit number we added it back isn't it to get rid of it so add back the depreciation to get to cash because depreciation was making profit smaller then add on the synergies because that's going to make my profit bigger it's either going to be big set more sales or less costs and then take off tax one what is the most important fundamental reason for mac to acquire for mine to acquire mac to acquire strategic op options to gain economies of scale to maximize acquiring firm value or to entrench management <laughs> Stephen, I'm going to pick on you. One. Okay. I think if we eliminate, I like to eliminate, isn't it? If we eliminate, sure. I would eliminate that one. Isn't it? Would you eliminate that one? Yeah. Fundamental reason. Most important. Most important fundamental reason. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I would say three. The three, three. The acquiring firm is mine, isn't it? Acquiring firm. What did it say there at the top of the thing? Acquiring firm was mine, Co. Is it? Yeah. 
what is the fundamental reason why mine would want to acquire Mac or any company is to increase its value. Do you agree? I'd say that. Although I do agree that number one and two make that happen, isn't it? But I think that I would go with three. I don't know. You know, with these things, then I'm going to say to you that I, what I think, and you're going to say what you think. And do you know, there's been, there was once a time when a student of mine actually did better than everybody else because they took one of the questions and they changed their minds and they thought, no, that they, they decided on a different um, one of these. Especially these, it could, they could all be true, isn't it? So now you're looking at what is the fundamental, most important, and I'll leave it up to you to decide. It says, which of the following is not an anti-takeover defense? Okay, so you'll see they refer to this website because the textbook that you've been given for this module doesn't go into takeover defenses, right? And takeover defenses are really interesting. Let me show you. I took a picture of the site. Here it is, Finance Maps of the World. Look at the names of these takeover defenses. Staggered Board, Poison Pills, Super Majority Clause, Golden Parachute, Dual Class Recapitalization, Pac-Man Defense, Green Mail, Asset Restructuring, Litigation, Liability Restructuring. And I didn't do the rest, but there was another page that had all these extras. Yeah. These are things that the companies that are being targeted for takeover can do to protect themselves. Yeah. So if somebody's targeting you, they want to buy your company, what can you do to protect yourself so that they go away? Yeah, that's these. Anti-takeover defenses are also called anti-takeover tactics. They are applied by target companies to avert acquirers or bidders. This is specifically seen in the United States that carries an extensive and diverse history of takeovers. Right, so if we just go back here, they actually do define them for you. And the first one they talk about is they talk about a virus. I don't know if I'm even pronouncing it correctly. How do you pronounce it? Hubris. Hubris. Hubris, they say, is overconfidence on the part of management, which causes them to overinvest shareholders' money and make inadvisable acquisitions. So I also looked up hubris because I thought, what the heck is that? I've never heard of that. And I looked it up in Wikipedia, which you shouldn't believe, eh? I don't know, I've been told. Wikipedia says, managerial hubris is the unrealistic unre belief held by managers in bidding firms that they can manage the assets of a target firm more efficiently than the current management. It's one reason a, merger, a manager may choose to invest in a merger that on average generates no profits. So if you're looking for a company to buy, you find a company that's actually doing really badly and you believe that you can do better than the existing manager and that's why you would buy it. But do you agree that that isn't a, an anti-takeover tactic? It's not even from Mac's perspective. It's from mine's perspective, isn't it? So that one is the one that is not, is the one that here is not one of the, what, where, are, where am I now? Yeah. Oh, back. So I do think it is this one. It is that one. <laughs> but let's look at the others. Green mail. Green mail is where the target company buys back its own shares at a premium from the company that plans to make an acquisition. So there was a time, I don't know, more things that you guys don't know. There was a time that Nedbank started to buy Standard Bank shares on the sly. They just went to the stock exchange and they just started buying Standard Bank shares. And then at some point what happens, you do that like you sneak. But at some point you reach a limit, hey, which according to the Companies Act, you now need to disclose yourself. You can't just keep buying sneakily shares until you earn 50% or whatever it is. There's a point, 15 or something like that, where you have to then announce yourself. So then they announce themselves. They announced that they were looking to take over Standard Bank, Ned Bank. If you go and read up on the net, you'll find it, right? And Standard Bank then tried everything they could to make themselves not be a takeover target, isn't it? The last thing they wanted is to be taken over by Ned Bank. It's almost, I don't know if you've heard of the term reverse takeover, because it's a smaller company trying to buy a bigger company, right? So green mail is where the target company, Standard Bank, would buy back its own shares from the company that plans to make the acquisition from Ned Bank at a premium. 
And do you agree? That would make them go away. And maybe they'd even be happy because they're, sh- they're making some money, isn't it? Because they've been buying shares. If they then, if Standard Bank buys them back from them at a premium, they make some money and they go away. It's a way to make some money, perhaps. Scare them, big, big ugly beast, and then you pay them to go away. So that would, that's called green mail. It's like black mail. No, it's not. It's green mail. The next one is golden parachute. Golden parachute is where they enter into contracts with the existing management whereby they give them, they promise them or agree to give them huge severance packages in the case of a takeover. We talked about earlier already how in a takeover, those big managers, they lose their jobs, isn't it? So in this case, that's a golden parachute. So if Standard Bank took all their top execs and gave them all big severance packages contracts, those contracts, when the buyer buys them, they're liable for those contracts, isn't it? Because it's a contract. And so now, suddenly, this merger is costing them a, a whole lot more money. Golden parachute. And scorched earth defences. Scorched earth defences is where the target company makes itself as unattractive as possible by selling or destroying assets. So, for example, a company that has a big cash balance or bank balance, they might be a target because somebody sees that they've got a lot of cash, isn't it? Like the rich husband. But if that person or if that company decides to pay that all out as a dividend, they suddenly don't have that asset anymore. Then they're not so attractive, isn't it? So if that rich husband decides he's going to give all his money to the SPCA, then he's not going to be so attractive anymore. So of these four, it was number one, isn't it? But these are what we call tactics or um, anti-takeover tactics, things that you can do to try and prevent a takeover, a hostile takeover, if you don't want the company to buy you. Okay, 19, we've got two more to go. 19, 2014 was a huge year for M&A. Refer to this article in fortune.com. You've all heard of Fortune magazine? If you haven't, go look at the website. It's a really interesting magazine. It's very readable. You know, sometimes financial press is very sort of up there and you struggle to... But Fortune magazine is very readable. It says, which region has the largest amount of M&A activity and has the longest history of this type of activity? Which one do you think if you had to guess? USA, yeah. But let's have a look. I did print... I did take the article off. Here's the Fortune... Global deal activity jumped 47% between 2013 and 2014. Global merger and acquisition activity hit $3.5 trillion in 2014, which is up 47% from the year before. That's the word from Reuters, whose data suggests that the large deals in 2014 valued at $5 billion, 95 of them were valued at $5 billion or more were a key driver given the overall number of global M&A transactions only climbed by 6%. So in the US it was huge compared to everywhere else. No, global. This includes the year's three largest announced deals, each of which is still pending. Comcast has a deal with Time Warner. You've all heard of Time Warner. I don't know if you've heard of Comcast, but you had heard eh, that there was a Time Warner. I don't know if you'd heard anyway. AT&T, it's the telecoms, eh? Um, 67 billion rand to buy a direct TV. That direct TV guy is making a lot of money. <laughs> and then Activis is paying 66 billion for Allergen. That sounds like pharmaceuticals, eh? Isn't Allergen ph- pharmaceuticals? Okay, so those are the three. Ten of the year's 15 largest acquisitions were for companies based in the United States, where volume climbed by 51%. European M&A was also up. Asia Pacific was the highest ever. Geographical regions with decreases included Eastern Europe, Central America, and Africa, Middle East. The largest large country increase was for France, while Germany was on the flip side. So France was the biggest country. Germany was on the flip side. Thompson also reported that there were nearly 562 billion of global private equity activity. I've explained to you before what private equity is, isn't it? To this class, not to this class. Private equity is when is like Warren Buffett's company. You give Warren money, and he takes that money and invests it in companies. Usually, private equity he's investing in unlisted companies. 
That's the industry's highest mark. Perhaps more importantly, it's 21%, and it seems to be at an all-time high. Um, pretty remarkable given the dearth of mega LBOs, leveraged buyouts last year, which was offset by the number of firms wanting, willing and able to play in the space. So not everybody can afford a billion dollars, really. <laughs> Surprising. Pitch Book also released a bunch of private equity data sh showing that 60% of the, of the 2014 activity was for add-on investments. It's also reported that global private equity exit activity was $445 billion, which is a record high. For private equity fundraising, Pitch Book shows a drop of $353 billion for the year. Okay. So pri private equity is where you as an individual give a company that's listed on the stock exchange your money, but they don't do anything. They're going to take that money and invest it. Sometimes in listed companies, but a lot of the time in unlisted companies. Because um, you wouldn't be able to as an individual invest in an unlisted company necessarily, isn't it? Private equity. Um, all right, so let's see what this thing was. Which region just an amount of MA activity and has the longest history. And it is US, isn't it? I think we had already. Well, Brent's brother was bought out by Maskers and made a fortune. Yes. Yeah, a tech company and they just bought a tech. Yeah, those are the guys that are making all the money now. Eh? Is all those guys that started those little businesses that in the garage. It's usually tech. Yeah. And now, you know what's happening is that the tech companies, the, the ones that started and were new, they had a lot of internal growth. Like if you look at the Googles and the Amazons and whatever. But then the, their internal growth is also coming to a stop. So in order to keep growing, they're now having to do mergers. So you see a lot of those happening, isn't it? Okay, the latest merger to hit the news is ours, isn't it? Somebody wants to buy, say, breweries. Who is it? You drink beer. Huh? <laughs> They've bought it already. American, American beer company, is it? Huh? British. British beer company. Isn't it terrible? I think it's terrible. It was our one sort of like shining star of South African businesses. It was listed on all the exchanges around the world. Anyway, it says when British Airways merged with Iberia, you've all heard of Iberia and British Airways, yeah, Iberia is the Spanish airline. What kind of merger was it? Vertical, horizontal, joint venture, or conglomerate? Joint venture is not even a type of merger. It's horizontal. It's a competitor, right? All right. Assignment one complete. Oh, we can. Did we not check them? The, uh, did we not do them the last time? Oh, really? Is that so? Um, so, I sent you home to do answers and have you done them? This class is lacking. I don't have to make two or one. That's because you have a preference for finance stuff rather than accounting costing stuff. Yeah. It depends on the preference. Common prefers this one, eh, Common? Uh, prefers accounting, yeah. costing. Yeah. But students, there are students who prefer the finance, yeah. It's also much more like topical if you're interested in that stuff and you you read in the financial press, it's going to be more finance stuff okay. than costing or accounting. I like reading money webs, so more oh, okay, then, yeah, it will be. You won't find activity based costing talked about on money web. Okay, let's hear it. What did we have for number one? <laughs> number one, we had one. I had three. Oh gosh. You did it. Yeah. I had three. What did you, did you all have one? They're asking for turnover. They've given you gross profit. Am I right? And they said gross profit is five. 5172. So gross profit is 5172. And they said to you that the gross profit margin is on cost. Did you see that? So it looks like this. This is the profit margin. This is cost. 
Oi, oi, oi. No, sorry, I'm not that tall. I'm right up there. I have to start further down. This is the profit margin. This is cost. So this is sales. <laughs> what the? Sorry, it's because my fat stomach <laughs> pressed both of those buttons at the same time. My husband tells a story where he went to the gym and he was running on the treadmill and his stomach kept hitting that like emergency <laughs> stop thing. <laughs> He had to stop. See how the gym is supposed to be there for fat people, hey? But it's very fat unfriendly. Okay, look how horrible that looks. But okay, that's what it is, isn't it? So, do you agree? That's the, what they've said. Gross profit is 33 and a third of cost. So, this is the number. This is 51.72. And I want that number up there. So the number that you have is this number, 15518. It's that number. Isn't it? We use the gross profit margin formula and then we solve for X. Because gross profit margin is usually based on sales. But this gross profit is based on cost. Sorry, it's a bit of costing. <laughs> so the answer is if you add those two together, that's the answer. Because that's cost, a third of that is profit, isn't it? That's what they say. So therefore sales is three, is it? Yeah, that's what I had. Sorry, most of you would have had one, but it's just because of what it says. Okay, number two, interest cover. What did you have? Okay, I had two. What? Did you see there was interest income? Did you see interest income there? Let me rather do that because it looks like I'm going to be doing some questions here. So what I said is I said interest income is covered by profit before interest and tax plus the interest income divided by the interest expense. That's what I said. Like that. So then I got I got two. But it's just because this P&L is a really funny P&L. You know, where do we put interest income into a P&L? In other income at the top. So is it in the profit before tax number? It is. In this case, it isn't in that profit before tax number, so I've had to add it in. So I don't know. If you want to say four, four is without the 55, isn't it? But you'll see later, there'll be one where you didn't get an answer, and it's because of the 55. All right, the next one, number three. What was the answer for that one? Three, you should have all got three. Yeah. Because that was just an increase. It's a decrease. We're decreasing from 198, 1098, to 1036. And it's an increase from prior year, so we divide by 1098. Uh, yeah, you're supposed to do this the other way around. Yeah, let me put the formula the other way. But it is a decrease. Do you agree it's a decrease? The cost's dropped. So the cost is now 1036 minus 1098 over 1098. Whenever we look at change, we look at the change from the year that it was. Okay. Number four, what did you get? Yeah, you see, if you add the 55, isn't it? So, <clears throat> it says calculate earnings before interest, after tax, using the effective tax method. So, when you look at the effective tax, tax is 342 out of 1207. Effective tax rate, 28.33%. Then I said, earnings before interest, I added the... 
interest income and I got one four what is that number one four five three and then I took the 28.33 percent the 28.33 off which is what one four five three twenty eight point three three percent four one two four one two and then I get one oh four one which is answer number one and this one if you didn't do the adjustment for the 55 I don't think you would have got an answer am I right ugly okay um, number five what did you guys get four, four. four yeah number six yeah so got two number seven did you get a three how did you get that I can't remember let's use some formula so it's EBIT over total assets minus total give me the numbers uh, one three nine eight six one nine three six one nine three six one nine three minus one I thought I had done that. So you get 1398 over 4801. And what was the number that you got there? 2912. Yeah. So yeah, this one is a problem because you know I've done it. I've done it. I've done so many things with this one. I've done it with the 55. Then I've um, adjusted for you know that there's that. Um, can you see under current liabilities, there's a portion there of the long-term debt, the 276. So I adjusted for the 276 because I think the 276, it's just accounting that we stick it there, isn't it? Because it is actually part of your long-term debt. It's just that it's going to be repaid in the next year. So I adjusted for the 276. I don't know, but I didn't get an answer. So that one, I don't know, it's going to be like any, mini miny mo. Or they're going to change it before it's due. I don't know. I haven't looked on the site. Who, who, anybody been looking at the site? <laughs> before we submit, we must look at that site. Okay, then number eight. Okay. What did you get? Four. You also got four. That one is straightforward. Does anybody need to look at it? No. Number nine, debt ratio. Two. Yeah, also got two. And then number ten. What did you get for 10? 3. Yeah. Okay. So the problems were, you know, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I must adjust this for the 55 as well or not. You don't get an answer, no. And then I don't know if I should adjust the bottom and put the that short-term portion of long-term debt in there. But I don't get any. I, I promise you I've done it. I don't know, how many answers have I got for number seven? One, two, three, four. And I've got some more in the front here because I thought, let me do this differently. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine different answers that I've got doing different things with the numbers. None of them are the same as those four. Sometimes it helps to try work backwards, eh? But I couldn't work backwards to the numbers. So what they sometimes do is they will either adjust it or they will mark them all right, what I've seen before, they fix, if there's a mistake. They fix it and before it's due they tell you this is the, the adjustment to the question or they mark them all right or they ignore it so they mark it out of 19 instead of out of 20. Okay. So sorry about that, I don't know. It can be tricky but you've seen it, isn't it? It's... You know what, the more that you read Financial Press, read MWeb, go read Fortune magazine, read, I've told you this last time, eh? read your newspapers, the more things will be 
comfortable when you see it. Because the worst is that you pick up a question, like we just saw this one with mine and Mac, okay? and it's so practical. It's so like something that really happened. And it just throws you, hey, and the kind of questions they ask are not theory. They're not like from a textbook. they applied, and that throws you if you don't have some of that foundation. But that foundation you get not from reading the textbook. You get it from reading financial press, from reading the websites, isn't it? From reading when there's that M&A activity. There was that big SA Breweries deal. I must admit that I thought it was still unapproved, that deal, that it wasn't yet final, that they were still talking numbers. But maybe it is, maybe it is approved. I don't know. Um, but if it is, that's going to be the big M&A deal for us this year, isn't it? Because it is human, humongous, humongous. It's a pity we aren't all SA Brewery shareholders. We could make some money. Damn it. So we, yeah, I mean, I wanted to start WAC. You finished? I don't want it. Yo, let's have a five minute break. <laughs> okay, so the topic that we were supposed to start today, because I wanted to just get that assignment out of the way, is WAC. And I was going to spend two weeks on it, so we will carry on next week. So today I just want to do a little bit. Um, you remember the WAC calc from second year, or why we need the WAC calc, isn't it? The reason that I need weighted average cost of capital is because there is there are a number of sources of capital in a business so as a business you'll get capital from shareholders you'll get capital from banks you will get capital from individuals you will get pref shares debentures you will get loans you will get shares, equity, and you're getting money from a whole lot of places, isn't it? This money that you get from a whole lot of different places, then you will need to use to buy assets. And we need to make sure that these assets that we're buying with this money generate enough of a return to pay back all of those people, isn't it? Because the banks, they want interest on their loans. The debenture holders also want interest on their loans. The preference shareholders, they want their dividend. And then the ordinary shareholders also want a dividend. And this asset that you buy has to be enough to pay back all of those people, isn't it? So we work out a weighted average cost of capital. So the weighted average cost of capital calculation really I like to do it in rands. Just looks at the capital sources that I have, the cost of each one, and then works out a weighted average cost of capital. Yeah. And in there are a number of ways of doing this weighting. Over here I talk about weighted. There are a number of ways of doing that weighting to decide how to weight it. There are three. The one is to use historical book values. And maybe in second year at some point we've used historical book values. The other one is to use market values, current values, today's values. The third is to use an optimal debt to equity ratio to do your weighting. When we look at those three, this one is historic. It's the past. It's not a great one. We don't like that one. That one reflects what the value was of these capital pieces, loans, debentures, shares, pref shares, when they were issued, which might also be all different time values of money. I issued shares 25 years ago, then I issued some pref shares 10 years later, then I... Two years ago, I got a big loan from the bank for a new factory. Isn't it? All different time values of money. So we don't like the historical. Market value is today. So today is not bad. We don't dislike today. 
today is better than um, it's it's better than uh, historic. At least everything has the same time value of money, isn't it? Optimal is actually the best. Optimal is the future. Because if you've identified a optimal debt equity ratio, that's what you're going to be striving towards, isn't it? We talked about that a little bit last week. That's what you're going to be aiming for, that optimal debt to equity ratio. This is the future, so this is the best. But the truth is that most of the time you'll be given market values. You won't be given optimal debt to equity. You won't be given historical. You'll have to use market values. So when at third year we do the WAC calc, we're looking for the market value of shares, the market value of the loan, the market value of the prefs, and the market value of the debentures. And you remember from second year, we started to do a bit of work on market values. Do you remember? And then we use the cost. And when we're looking at cost, we're looking at the cost of equity. We're looking at the cost of debt, the cost of prefs, the cost of the debentures. And it's important that when we're looking at cost of debt and cost of debentures, we work after tax. And that's because... The other numbers are after tax, and it, we can't work with some numbers before tax and some numbers after tax, because it gives us a funny number, isn't it? So we work with after tax numbers here, then the numbers here also are after tax, and that's something that we didn't do in second year. We didn't look at tax over here. So these numbers here are also after tax. Now, in second year, we sometimes looked at market values, but when we looked at shares and market values of shares, most often than not, you were just given a share price. Do you remember that? But in third year, we're going to spend quite a bit of time, and that's what we're going to start today, and we're going to spend a bit of time next week. We're going to spend a bit of time doing valuations of those shares to determine that market value. Yeah? And that's the thing that I want to just touch on today. So that's just big picture. We're going to spend time doing the detail. We're going to go through examples for each one. How do we work out market value? How do we work out market value of loans, prefs, debentures, after tax? How do we work out the costs? Remember cost of equity. We can use CAPM, which we did last week. We can use the dividend model, isn't it? Or we can use the subjective method. So we're going to look at all of those. But for today, I want to just talk about this market value of shares and look at the first method of looking at the market value of shares. And just to give you an idea, when I do a valuation of shares, what some of the principles are, the value of anything in financial accounting, when we finance, the value of anything is the present value of the future cash flows. The value of anything is the present value of the future cash flows. Okay? If we're looking at valuing shares, the future cash flows for shares are dividends. The future cash flows for shares are dividends. Do you agree? So if I know what the future dividends are, I can discount those to today. That's the value of those shares. So I'm looking at valuing the present value of the future dividends. If you're a shareholder, remember you asked me earlier, if you're a shareholder, how do you make money? You earn dividends and you get capital growth. But if you hold that share to infinity, you're going to only earn dividends, isn't it? The other key thing with the valuation of shares is that this valuation must go to infinity. It's a perpetuity, unfortunately. It's a perpetuity. So at some stage, we have to use a perpetuity formula because we can't possibly get sh sh uh, dividends forever, isn't it? And the perpetuity formula we use is a formula which I don't know if we touched on in second year. We might have. It's called the dividend growth model or Gordon growth model. That model says that the value of a share today is equal to the dividend that I'm going to get next year, payment one, over R, or cost of equity, 
let's make it cost of equity over the cost of equity minus g which is growth you remember this formula from last year the value of the market value today or the value today is equal to the next dividend which is going to grow at g for infinity so here's your perpetuity payment over i isn't it perpetuity formula okay however when we are valuing shares sometimes we are able to determine what the actual dividend is going to be for the foreseeable future isn't it so when we do the valuation of shares we do something which says in year one i know the dividend in year two i can estimate the dividend in year three i can estimate the dividend but then from year four onwards it's difficult to estimate the dividend but i expect a growth of inflation or slightly above inflation let's say 10 percent or seven percent or eight percent whatever it is so when i have this i have to present value all of these cash flows do you agree when i present value these cash flows this is what they look like here's my timeline it goes to infinity do you agree i start this is your naught. this is today your naught is always today here you are you're standing today and you're holding on to these shares and you're wondering geez i wonder what these shares are worth the shares are worth the present value of the future dividends so i say to myself what are those future dividends in year one i know what that amount is because the sh maybe the dividends even been declared already isn't it there will be a dividend at the end of the year it will be this much in year two management has said we expect the business to grow by a certain amount so i can just estimate the dividend in year two in year three management has also said you know next year the year after this is what we expect so we can estimate a dividend in year three then year four we can't estimate a dividend anymore but we estimate a growth seven percent so when i'm doing a pv over here it's the pv of future cash flows or future dividends and it's the pv of these future dividends from year one until when infinity year infinity so i can take year one and discount that back to today that should be easy isn't it you know how to do that i can take your two and discount that back to today that's easy i can take your three and discount that back to today that's also easy but what about your four to infinity this is where now i'm going to plug that formula in because that's a perpetuity now to infinity isn't it so i plug the formula in the formula you remember said p zero is dividend one over r i'm going to just say r r minus g now the next dividend is not dividend one isn't it it's dividend what four isn't it look at this and I've, i'm already i know what the dividend is going to be one two three and i've already discounted those so i'm working from year four to infinity so my next dividend is not dividend one it is in fact dividend four when that was a one this was a zero so if that's a four what does this become this becomes a three so i plug my numbers in dividend four would be dividend three plus the seven percent do you agree this becomes seven percent this is given whatever is given and the answer will give me at year three the value of dividend year four to infinity because it's a perpetuity isn't it i'm saying i'm going to get this dividend growing at that amount forever there's my perpetuity this perpetuity is from year four to infinity it's going to give me a value at year three of year four to infinity but now i'm still at year three am i at year naught not yet so now i have to take this year three and bring this also back to year naught and now at year naught you'll see i have four numbers i have the present value of the first year's dividend i have the present value of the second year's dividend i have the present value of the third year's dividend and i have the present value of the dividend from year four to infinity yeah 
So this is the calculation I want you to practice doing. The example is in your study guides. If you want to have a look, it is on page... Oh, come on, behave. It is on page 43. 43. The following information relates to a South African-based company. They recently paid a dividend of one and a half million. It's already paid. Is it a future dividend? No, it's not, isn't it? Am I going to put it in my numbers? No, you've already got it. You've spent it probably, isn't it? Whatever you got of that one and a half million. So this one is not important. Here's my important bit. In year one, we expect the dividends to be 15% more than the, the dividend you just got paid. In year two, 10% more than year one. In year three, 8% more than year two. In year four onwards, 6%. This is G now, isn't it? G is sustainable growth. So when my growth stays the same, that's when I have G. So year four is when I'm going to be able to plug it into that formula that I just showed you. Okay? Let's just see what they say here. One of the shareholders who owns 10% wants to sell his shares and he wants you to make him an offer. A fair rate of return is 16%. So cost of equity... 16%. They want you to value a 10% shareholding. What is the pre value of those shares? The present value of the future dividends discounted at 16%. You think you can do it? You're going to try. So what you can do is you can do a timeline and you know that cash flow function on your calculator, you can use the cash flow function and do it all at once if you want, isn't it? So you're going to put on here year one, year two, year three, yes, and then year four to infinity is over here. You're going to do the formula P3 equals dividend four over R minus G. And then do you agree that this is at year three and this will be at year three those are both at year three so when you plug it into your calculator in your cash flows cash flow for year naught is naught then that will be cash flow one this will be cash flow two these two together will be cash flow three i will be 16 and you do an npv or you do them one by one by one which is the way they do it in the solution can you have a financial calculator on your phone? I saw it last time. You're pretending you don't. Okay. Let's have a look. We've got five minutes. So, let's look back at the principle of what we're doing. We are trying to value shares. The principle is that the value of anything is the present value of the future cash flows. If you own shares and you're going to own them to infinity, which is the presumption you make, because if you knew that you were going to sell them, you would actually try and work out what you could sell them for at a certain point and put that in, right? That would be your cash flow. If you're holding them to infinity, then you need to value the present value of dividends from year one all the way to infinity, to perpetuity, yeah? The way we do that is we look at the dividends we know we're going to get, and then we apply this formula to the dividends that we don't know where we can estimate a growth. And if that, if that growth is zero, then that is zero, isn't it? Then it's just payment over I, which is your perpetuity formula from time value of money. Okay, so if I apply that to the, this example, then the example, the timeline looks like this. In year naught, I got a dividend, but it's already in my pocket. I already have it. It's not a future dividend. In year one, I'm going to get a dividend of 1725 which is 1.5 plus 15%. In year 2, I'm going to get 10% more than that, 1897.5. In year 3, 8% more than that, 2049.3. That's like school days, eh? you can do that. In year 4, 6% growth now, 2172.258. Okay, and then... From year 4 to infinity, it's going to grow at 6% every time. Plus 6, plus 6, plus 6. I can't keep doing plus 6 forever. So then I apply the formula, isn't it? The perpetuity formula, which is 
payment over I, payment over I. But because there's going to be growth, I'm going to make I smaller. So there's my payment, it's my dividend in year 4, over I, which is R minus G, 16 minus 6, 10%. And because I'm plugging in dividend 4, I'm going to get a value as at year 3, because that's the way the formula works. Yeah? It gives you the answer, a PV, the year before. So I plug in dividend 4, it gives me the answer at year 3. When I plug in 21722.58 divided by 10%, I get 21722.58. Yeah? Or oh, I don't know if there's a number on there, maybe. <coughs> So now, when I'm plugging the numbers into my financial calculator, what I know is that this dividend in year 1 is 1.725, in year 2 is 1.897.5, and in year 3, I'm going to get that dividend for year 3, plus the value of year 4 to infinity, which I'm also going to bring back to year 3, is going to be this big number, 23.771. What this represents is dividend 1, dividend 2, Dividend 3 and the present value of dividend 4 to infinity. So I have all the dividends, year 1 all the way to infinity. I plug those into my calculating using that CFI function and I do an NPV. I must remember to do a zero first. And then I do an NPV at 16%, I get 18,858. If you look at their solution, they do the same thing. They do a timeline which looks a little bit different. Okay, but it's a timeline. Do you agree? There's your one. There's your two. There's your three. And then they did a calculation to get your four to infinity. Here's the calculation at the bottom. It's the same calculation we did. They took your three's dividend, grew it by 6%, and divided by R minus G. And they, get, they got the 21722. And they put this 21722 here in year three. Because you're getting a, year, you're getting a time value of money, which is P3. The value at your three. They then took each one and they used tables. You won't even get tables in your exam. Tables we got in second year, but in third year you'll have to use your financial calculator. But they use tables and so they, they, they therefore get a different answer to you because of rounding. But do you agree that it's exactly the same numbers that you plugged into your calculator? And you did tell your calculator that was year one, that was year two, that was year three. And you told your calculator to discount using an I of 16. And when you did an NPV, I don't know, my first in, I got different numbers and then I gave up and used Carmen's NPV, 18, 858. Oh, 1 to 6. You see, I forgot that bit. 18, 1 to 6, 858. Okay. 8, 18, 1, 2, 6, 8, 5, 8. And they get 18, 1, 2, 8, 1, 3, 4. Okay, so the difference is rounding. It's because they round to three decimals each time. Okay. Um, but they, get, they show another method. Oh, yeah, alternative method. Oh, inputs in your calculator. Okay. So then they do show the inputs in your calculator, and if you input it, you get the same answer, 18126858. We were only asked for 10% investment, so we times by 10% to get 18, to get 1.8 million. And then you'll see what they do at the end, yeah, they do a little thing which is an adjustment for a minority. And they reduce the number. Now, I really don't like this, and I'm going to try and explain it to you. Do you agree that every shareholder gets that dividend, regardless of whether they own one share or they own all the shares? They all get that dividend, isn't it? So when we're doing a PV, the answer that we get should be the answer for any shareholder. So now what they've said in this question at the end here is they say, because it's a minority, his shares are worth less. But I prefer to see it the other way. I prefer to see it that this is the value of one share even. But if you're a majority shareholder, your shares are worth more because you can go to the company and say, I want you to pay a higher dividend, isn't it? Whereas as a minority shareholder, you've got to take whatever the dividend is that the company's chosen to give. So the way I like to see it, and I know there's a lot of contention and discussion and people have done doctorates and master's things 
theses on these principles of valuation. But what you'll see in UNISA's questions is you'll alternately see either an adjustment for a minority, and you can see they're reducing the value by 12%, or an adjustment for a majority where they increase the value. And for me, when you're doing dividend model, dividend model is a valuation for a single share. And so this value that you're getting is the lowest possible value for that one share. If you're buying 50% of the shares, then we should increase the value because you then can go to an AGM and say, I want more paid out as a dividend. I want all those reserves paid out as a dividend, isn't it? And that increases the value. So, I don't know, I just wanted to explain that. I don't really like it, but they say you should not offer more than 1.6 million, 1595. It says, we do not provide you with the size of a minority discount, but it's left to your judgment. As long as you use a reasonable adjustment, the marker will, will mark that discounted rate in your calculations. I don't know. I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> what? How do you put that into your calculator? What kind of calculator have you got? Shop. Who's got a shop? Do you know how to put it in? The cash flows. The cash flows. I don't know what the cash flows are. Yeah, you put it all in. So you put Z. No, put zero first. C, cash flow zero. Then you put the next one, 1725. Cash flow one. Then put the next one. There we go. What are we doing? Okay, I'll finish it. All right, guys, I'll see you next week. We're going to carry on with WEC.